Hello everyone, uh, sorry about that. I'm now, now with you. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Luke and I run Theatre Bath. Uh, we're here today to talk about the arts in Bath and um, also kind of get a snapshot of where we are as an industry. Um, so a few bits of housekeeping before we start. Uh, the webinar has been recorded and it's also been streamed live via our YouTube channel. Uh, participants can't see each other, it's not like a normal Zoom meeting, but you can ask us questions using the question box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we've already had a few that have been emailed over to us, uh, so uh, I'll get, get to those at the end of the session. Um, if you want to ask a question in person, we can bring you in as a panellist, so please just indicate that. Uh, what that will do is Zoom will kick you out and then bring you back in with the upgraded level of panellist. Um, you can also ask a question via audio only, so if you want to just ask a question via audio, we can activate your microphone and you can do it that way. Um, so how this session is going to go, we're going to bring in the panellists one at a time, uh, we'll allow them to talk about their organisation, and then I will bring out uh, Bryn, who is from the forum, who's agreed to co-host this with me. Um, so that I can kind of focus on all the technical stuff and make sure people are brought in and out as and when we want to. So let me bring Bryn back in to us and we will get started. Yeah, hi there guys, very nice to see you all. Welcome, as Luke says, to this webinar. Um, we look forward to trying to answer your questions for you and share a little bit of what we know. Um, we don't have all the answers, but what we do know we're very willing to share with you. And we also um, share with you our Rona haircuts. And for some of us, there's uh, children and dogs and all sorts going on. And for me, there is the little bit of traffic noise that is coming back into Bath as I'm speaking to you directly from the Forum coffee shop here at uh, Bath uh, Forum. So welcome. And Luke's going to be bringing some, um, some folk in today um, and we're going to co-host it together. For some of us, we know of each other, but we don't know each other very well um, necessarily. So you'll see some bits and pieces as we work this out. But we hope that it will be of benefit to you. And I'm also seeing I could do with the old Rona shave as well. So I think lots of us are finding out that Zoom is not necessarily our friend after this uh, stressful time. So, um, welcome. Lovely, thank you very much for that, Bryn. Um, so could you give us a bit of an indication about where the forum is and kind of how you guys are dealing with it and what your plans are for the future? Yeah, so I think represented today on the panel, we've got a range of people from all sorts of sizes of um, theatre uh, across Bath. And the forum, as most of you will know, is one of the largest uh, fully seated venues in the southwest and as a result of that we um, we tend to do things that are global or national tours so what we're seeing in fact is people who are uh, making the decision where if their entire tour um, is uh, is cancelled uh, uh, sorry has ha has lost some of the shows from the front end of the year then even if the venue can reopen um, commercially they might make this individual event or gigs as we often put on um, work, but they can't necessarily make the whole um, tour work. So we are seeing a, a, a large number of postponements. Um, for us, not cancellations as yet. We've had, I think, one event that was unable to, um, to uh, commit to reappearing, and that was because of the age of the band, ostensibly. Um, so I do think it creates a, a great opportunity within Bath as well, because some of the um, uh, creative organisations that might have felt that they were not able to bring the required number of audience for the size of seats that we have, um, may well find, of course, with social distancing and things, that um, venues of our size are actively looking for a small number of people. Um, and so that might enable um, local creatives to use the space more and so on, which is something we here at the Forum have always wanted to um, to see if we could sort out. So um, 
We're, we're looking forward to some of the new challenges. Um, you can hear the staff team behind me um, that are preparing the coffee shop as a way of opening the doors to, to folk. Uh, we're also considering um, heritage tours and things. Um, I believe that um, there's another theatre in Bath that does that, maybe theatre all, I'm not sure. Um, so we're looking at sort of diversifying and we're, we're in a strong position um, because we've managed to uh, run the organisation in a fairly um, frugal way. So we can go forward um, and, and be okay. So that's a sort of a, a really, really, uh, without detail, a rough sort of shot of, of where we're at. Brilliant. And if people want to get in contact with you to kind of talk about ideas and things for, for using the venue, how's best to do that? Um, so, yeah, we're, we're going out, um, as you know, live onto YouTube and things like that. So I, I won't give the um, uh, my exact details r right now on this in this moment, but um, it's quite easy to uh, to use uh, a bit of Googling and you will find the right email address for us. Perfect. Thanks very much, Bryn. Right, we'll bring in our second panellist now. So I would like to welcome in Andrea Harris from the Theatre Royal. Welcome in, Andrea. Oh. It says you're still muted, Andrea. There we go. Hi. Lovely job. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Good, good. Yeah, same, you know, as all, all the other speakers, you know, entirely different surroundings than I might normally be. But, um, yeah, good. And thanks for organising. It's really great to have another opportunity. We had a good Bath Cultural Education Partnership meeting yesterday um, online, and that was really nice seeing loads of different faces people across the city um, who are in a similar position to us and Bryn, you know, things are a bit bloody difficult at the moment aren't they yeah but, um but having said that you know still lots of really exciting ideas um lots of good opportunities um obviously with the theater you know we're all in the same boat where um it's all about proximity really <laughs> it's about proximity of the actors it's about proximity of the audience with one another to to the action so um, whilst we've got really wonderful audiences who've shown themselves while we um, had to cancel performances and be closed, uh, we expect them to be back strong. We just don't know when for the minute. So, so we're kind of trying to keep as flexible as we can, doing lots and lots of planning for all the different scenarios. Um, we're really lucky in that we've had a great couple of years. We've had some great work uh, that we've produced um, do well here, you know, do well with a lovely Bath audience, carry on, tour the country, end up in the West End, which means we've got reserves, you know, um, they're not infinite, um, but we do have reserves, and so that puts us in a strong position. Um, and we've also got lots of lovely community-facing work coming out of the egg, um, where they've been able to access uh, national funding for uh, work with our young people predominantly, uh, particularly around digital uh, digital technologies, um, emerging technologies in performance. So whilst our capacity to share our work hasn't been great now, we've not had the historic infrastructure for that, um, that's definitely going to become something that's really important. And Bath Egg Assembly um, is going to be bringing young people into uh, a theatre making, theatre training space that they create with our theatre professionals um, focused on emerging technology. So that's really exciting. Brilliant. And how are things kind of differed for you? Because obviously you've got the, the main house space, you've got the egg and you've got the Euston off. So you've got three whole entirely different spaces that all have different needs and, you know, uh, different things to consider about them really yeah i mean i'm sure anybody who knows eugene our general manager can imagine the um the planning and uh, worrying that he's been doing um i think you know until we know more i mean the five point plan is there uh, it, it, it's a gesture really and it gives us some opportunity to plan but it doesn't answer any questions what's tricky for us is that as a charity what happens you know for us on tour and nationally um, 
informs, funds essentially the work that happens in the Euston up and the egg. The Euston up and the egg are where our producing happens, where we create new work, where we train up artists, where that kind of creative ecology sits. And while the theatre can't make money, that's what suffers. So we're definitely having to piece together things. Uh, uh, going forward, it's just going to be about, as Bryn said, you know, being smart about it, opening the spaces um, in a way that's safe for everybody, where our audience is encouraged to come back. You know, they're, they're going to want to come to the door and we just have to make it easy for them. Perfect. Uh, do you have any questions to add to that, Bryn? Uh, no, I think uh, Andrew summed that up very nicely. I think one of the things that, um, am I right, Andrew, in thinking that you um, do use some volunteers for your front of house uh, on occasions? Is that right? Or have I got uh, that no, not really, actually. I mean, we've got um, a really great resource in the, the TRB Friends uh, fundraisers. They're brilliant. Um, and they, but they don't volunteer front of house. Um, so right, we don't it, have that problem at the moment. The, the reason behind the question is that one of the questions that we've been asked on the chat from the webinar is, uh, somebody has asked us how um, we as a group of people and in our venues would approach the use of volunteers. And so it just was really to give me the opportunity to say there, and I, uh, and I suspect you might echo this, that, that uh, in terms of all things health and safety within venues, um, volunteers are treated exactly the same as paid staff. And so, Definitely. Once, yeah, and so to answer that person's question, forgive me, I can't recall their name right in this moment, I would say to the questioner that um, I can't see that organizations would use volunteers less. Indeed, they might use them slightly more. Um, but they would treat them exactly the same as paid staff. So I, I wondered if behind the question was a bit of when can we re-volunteer for our yeah. local venue? And so I would suggest to you that the answer is that when paid front of house staff begin to uh, be used in venues again, that, that's when we'd see um, the re-emergence of volunteers. And I, I expect you would agree with that. Yeah, you, right? yeah you're exactly right, Bryn. I mean, actually, in the process of our appeal, we did ask for volunteers and have got some lovely volunteers joining the egg um, mostly not actually in front facing roles but where they would be absolutely it would be exactly the same as our manager staff we've got the same duty of care um, for, they, for those people uh, as our staff so yeah and uh, another question that we've been asked and it gives me the opportunity to explain away my slightly black hands that I've realised have been um, on view is we've been taking the opportunity to uh, redecorate and we've we painted our stage and things like that and I, I guess you're doing the same at uh, Bathia's Royal is that right? Yeah definitely there's lots of beavering away happening um, where it's possible yeah you know just about when we've been able to get the people in the building and the resource available but yeah definitely it's a good opportunity and I think you know beyond just the actual building what you were saying before Green, about sort of reimagining your offering um, thinking about what sort of diversity of product you've got as well as what you've done traditionally and how you you change the model that you use. I think lots of different theatres are thinking now about, you know, do we have to run things in the same way? Do we have to have our seasons look the same? Um, you know, what can we change? And actually that is, that's been the upside to this is that kind of enforced challenge brings an opportunity to think differently. Yeah, adversity brings uh, with it innovation, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ange uh, Andrea. We'll bring you back later for the panel discussion. Um, so I'll just turn your microphone and your video off again, and we'll bring in next Andy Burden from the Natural Theatre Company. So hello, Andy. Come on in. Um, it just takes a little while for Zoom to sort of reconfigure people's video. So uh, you're on mute there still, Andy. Uh, How are you doing? I'm all okay. right. Okay, thank you. Can you have a, uh, just make sure you can see me properly. There we go. It should be okay. So, so uh, thank you for being the natural. How are we doing? Um, yeah. Well, obviously, there's been a lot of publicity about people have to uh, reorganise audience spaces, and it's what the naturals have been doing for 50 years. So we feel perfectly placed to be a partner with as many organizations as possible 
to offer that solution, be they theatres, festivals or whatever, and we can do stuff outside. We've always been doing it. Um, and we meet people in the place where they go about their daily business. We don't need auditoriums. So hopefully we can um, help people solve that problem of getting audience back in a different way. I'll uh, just go through that, some of the things we can offer in a minute. Um, so, but we took, or I took a difficult decision at the beginning of this that we wouldn't do online work. We, we have a youth theatre that's working online out of, um, <clears throat> just to keep them connected, but we haven't been doing online stuff because we're ostensibly live and I, I didn't really want to use this time struggling to try and create something in a different medium. Um, <clears throat> so we, you know, most of the staff are on furlough. We're going to have a reduced staff after this unfortunately we've had to make two people redundant it is a sensible decision but we've i've looked very carefully at new strategies for how we organize the organization how we do our daily business and so on we kept in touch with all our performers we've been doing play readings and uh nights out at the lockdown arms we call it um and uh but the big news is we're ready to start again we are live and we'll be starting on monday at the roman baths so tomorrow I've got a site visit tomorrow. We've made a few films, people making a film for them and uh, a guidance of how to go around the Roman bars on Friday. And we might well be at the American Museum on Saturday. <clears throat> They're slightly confused and concerned about the DCMS's recommend, recommendations about how we do live performance. But in discussion with the Roman bars, we've decided we're doing costumed interpretation. We're not, that DCS, DCMS guidance seems to be for people sat in an auditorium or sat still somewhere. So we feel that we can, and the, the, the truth is we can go around and be quite safe and we're working on how we socially distance from people and so on. Um, but um, I think just for me to have a little, chat about the, the sort of philosophy getting through this and I think that you know some previous words this is a very positive meeting already and I thank you Luke you set it up beautifully for us all well, I was at the meeting yesterday and it was quite negative and I think what we have to do what I've done right from the beginning is say right okay what are our strengths and we've got to work with those strengths we've got to be clear-headed about how we get through this and put some really key strategies in place to ensure financially and structurally the company can continue through a year basically without anything that comes in in the next year as a bonus and we have that's what we're aiming for that we will be get back up if there is a, a vaccine or whatever next summer is when we're back up running again and anything in the meantime is a bonus and that's being clearness and being being clear minded and being resilient and trying to use the wisdom of the patterns of behavior in the company to make sure we can do that. Like the Theatre Royal, we have some reserves in place. We also own a building, so we can take loans against that building if necessary. Um, but one of the things about the naturals, and I think, you know, we're not a massive organization. We are a small to medium organization. So we've got some robustness in the organization, but we have also got the ability to uh, respond and be creative and uh, use these, these uh, uh, opportunities, um, which they are, you know, they, they, this is an opportunity to reinvent, you know, Brim was talking about redecorating. Well, we haven't done that. Um, we have, if you like, uh, looked at other aspects of what we're doing. Looking at that opportunity to sort of uh, think about this in a different way so we can be really adaptable to clients with whatever the new normal is. But I think the other key thing that I've realized we've had to do, there's going to have to be sacrifices, you know, that that's just going to happen. Um, and, you know, we've lost a couple of members of staff. We're going to have to look at our performing team. Uh, we've not been able to take any pay rises. We were going to take on another member of staff that's been lost immediately. Um, and once you accept that realism, I think you can find a solution to, to get through. And the key thing is not to wallow in self-pity and also the opposite, not to be overconfident. <laughs> it's got to be a very uh, pragmatic response to, to what's going on. So we're trying to look for partnerships now, find ways, you know, working with these pro proximity resist, uh, restrictions 
um, that we can work with any partners that want to work with us. And obviously we've got things like the Austin Undone show, which is walks about with about 15 people. They can keep socially distanced. The Shakespeare Undone show that, you know, we hope uh, we can do some other things. We've been talking to Ian at the Rondo. As soon as things are back and running, we'll try and do some indoor shows as well. We've got a great performance team and everybody's kind of hungry to do something. And the last thing I'd like to say, I haven't gone over my time, but the very last thing I'd like to say is that I think this is a great opportunity for new artists and new thinking to come forward. And some of the headlines, the doom and gloom headlines have come from people who are probably due to move over because I think there's new possibilities here. Might even be me, I hope not, but um, I think there's new possibilities. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Andy. Um, we'll bring you back later for the discussion. Um, um, we'll bring in our next panellist, um, who is Chris Stevens from the Holborn Museum. Um, so we'll just bring Chris in to speak to us. Uh, remember, if you do have a question, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen or as some of you have done already, kind of put it into the chat. So welcome, Chris. How are things over at the Holborn? Um, hi, Luke. Thanks for organising this. Um, I've just been at the Holborn this morning and um, it's very exciting. We're opening to the public on Sunday. Um, I mean, obviously, museums are in a much more fortunate position than um, theatres in these conditions. Um, I mean, in fact, I've been moaning that there's no reason why museums like the Holborn couldn't open like a shop a month ago, but there we are. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, suddenly having been sort of locked down and um, almost completely um, empty for 14, 15 weeks, we've suddenly got window cleaners and the air conditioning um, maintenance people in and the cafe staff of putting new signage and rearranging the furniture. Um, we've um, reinstalled um, our Grace and Perry exhibition to create a one-way system through the building um, and put various sort of signage around to sort of help maintain the two metre distancing. Um, so yeah, so we're ready to go with a kind of um, Waitrose style one-way system in one entrance, up the lift, down the stairs, out the side door, round to the cafe. Um, annoying that it looks like it's going to rain because I think the cafe and the garden is one of our sort of key assets. Um, so yeah, so we're really just waiting anxiously to see how many people are ready to come out um, and visit museums. I know that we're only one of two or three which are opening up in Bath. The, the baths have already been spoken about and the American Museum is opening um, a bit at a time. I think the gardens are already open and the exhibition opens on Saturday. Um, so um, yes, it feels like, um, I don't know, we've had a spent about a month, I guess, getting ready for this moment and preparing with all the sort of PPE and the different changes to the building. Um, and it feels that's all coming to a head now. And so we're moving into another phase, which is um, fantastic. I mean, it's been a long three, four months. And I think one of the great things we've managed to do <laughs> beyond just surviving um, is that the Grace and Perry exhibition, the pre-therapy years, which opened at the end of January, was due to close in late May. Um, we've extended that into January next year, um, which makes it a very long show. And amazingly, every all the 56 lenders have agreed to extend the loans of their works, even though it then goes on to Norwich and York. So it'll be running until September next year somewhere. Um, and I think it puts us, I mean, we're kind of in as good a position as we could be. I mean, in March, when we suddenly closed, it seemed very frustrating because the exhibition is by far the most popular thing we've ever done. I mean, the audience in February um, was more than double our record audience. Um, but it, that did mean that at least that when, you know, when we closed, we had maybe a bit more cash than we would normally have. It wouldn't have lasted long if we hadn't had furlough. Um, but it also means I think we have a really strong offer now as we reopen. And I think, you know, um, having something like an exhibition, which is a temporary thing, is a really strong thing at these times. So if people, you know, are in two minds about going out or not, you know, this is something which they can't, they won't be able to do this next summer. So I'm hoping that that will help 
drive people not just to the Holborn but also add to the attraction of Bath as a city, um, given the um, you know the lack of overseas visitors this summer. We need to attract as many domestic um, visitors as we can. So um, so I feel that we're in a strong position, um, relatively speaking. Um, I mean we've looked at capacity and if we get even 25% of the visitors we were getting before we closed I think we still we could still end the year over budget um, I mean part of the lesson of that though is that you can get someone else to pay your staff and you don't do too much it makes it it's much more economic than running a museum in normal times um, but it's also kind of I think exposed longer term the vulnerabilities of the whole but in all sort of small independent museums um, I was having a conversation with someone at the DCMS a few weeks ago and they were saying, well, you know, with social distancing uh, rules, will your income be less than your expenditure? And I was saying, well, it'd be extraordinary if it wasn't because it's always been that way in normal circumstances. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's forcing us, I think, to consider, you know, our structure and how we can make savings um, uh, in the longer term next year and beyond. Um, maybe more urgently than we were going to do because you know we have our reserves are depleted and we've been relying on those to a certain extent um i've been working to reduce our dependency on that but um uh, but that becomes more urgent now there's sort of we know our income will be going down from other sources um, and the reserves are sort of are more vulnerable i think but that's true you know i think one of the things about bath is that there are a lot of small museums all of them very sort of delicately balanced um, between sort of, you know, break even and deficit. Um, but I think actually one of the positive, but there are lots of positive things I think that come out of this period is that I see lots of evidence that the Arts Council and the DCMS now recognize the vulnerability of unsubsidized um, museums and other organizations, presumably that, you know, places like the Holborn have found a way of um, doing what they do um, without relying on public funding um, but it's sort of, they have now recognised, I think, those funders that that leaves us in the most vulnerable position. I certainly had the Arts Council acknowledging that, you know, independent museums were the most vulnerable museums in these circumstances. And um, so we were lucky to get a, a grant from, them, from their emergency funds as part of the funding we managed to secure. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for that, Chris. Uh, we've had one question come in. Bryn, do you want to, to take the question there? Yes, we can do that. Um, uh, and of course, you've got, got me at it because I'm looking at a couple of questions there and I'm not sure the ones There's that one you're thinking David of. But say again, sorry. One from David Rose there, which uh, I think was for Chris. Yes, I'm very sorry, you know, I'm showing, uh, showing some... I, I can of, see it if you want me to. You, you can see it. Great. Yeah. Well, dig me, out, dig, dig me out of the whole thing. All right, Brent, I'm going to say. So David Rose just... has asked, it says all panellists, what percentage of your visitors are local as opposed to tourists? Um, and I think it depends what you mean by local and tourists. Um, we, until this year, I used to moan that the Holborn only attracts, I think, 17% of our visitors are overseas tourists, which in Bath seemed like a terrible underperformance but actually that, that, that looks like quite a good situation to be in um but i think um something like 60 percent of our visitors come from more than 50 kilometers away something like that um so there's a significant right. number of locals um but also a significant number of people um who either visit us as part of a bigger bath visit or come especially for what we're doing brilliant Lovely. Well, we've got another speaker in. So thank you, Chris. Uh, for, we'll bring you back again for the panel discussion at the end. Uh, thank you for, for your time and for all your comments. And, and just to say, folks, if you have got a question that you're asking, we, we're, uh, we're going to try and make sure that we're aware of the ones we haven't answered and to deal with those in our Q&A session uh, at the end of the discussion. Lovely. So next, we're going to bring in Tom Madicott from Moles, who's come to join us to talk a bit about how Moles are doing at the moment. So I'll just make his video live for you. Hello, Tom. Hello, Hello there. 
glad to have you with us. <laughs> oh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no, it's it been very interesting hearing, you know, from all the different uh, cultural sectors in Bath. And it's nice everyone getting together like this. So how are things doing at Moles? And do you guys have a date for, for reopening there? Um, well, obviously, live music is still a big no-no. Uh, for, uh, so at the moment, we're really in limbo. Um, we're looking at if we can, uh, if it's economically viable for us to open just as a bar, but um, just to try and get some funds going, you know. But it's uh, it's tough because you know what we do is music, and at the moment that is banned. Um, we've obviously looked into how, what we can do when it's allowed, but the problem we have is being such a small capacity um, with any form of social distancing. Putting on a show is going to be pretty impossible unless you know the bands just want to go out and play um but, you know well we've had a lot of support from uh from locals we've had a lot of support from we have a very strong uh, connection with the universities um we work very, very closely with bar spa on their commercial music course um giving their bands um, showcases and opportunities to play so during the lockdown, we've, had, we've got a crowdfunder going and we've had a lot of those bands doing live streams from their homes for us, um, which has been lovely. And we've had a few big names uh, support us as well. Uh, a couple of big bands and very well-known people have uh, sent us little videos for us to post on our social media saying to support it. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Music Venues Trust, which I don't know if you guys are aware of, but it's, um, it's a charity which basically looks after grassroots music venues. Is about 800 members now, which has jumped up. It was 500 before before all this happened, but suddenly everyone's wanted to sign up and become a member. Um, we've been a member since the very beginning. We were like one of the first 30 people um, that set it up. And the whole purpose of the charity is to ensure survival of grassroots music venues, which have been hit hard um, even before this. Uh, um, they've done fantastic work. They've got like an emergency response team when people have licensing issues or people building the set of flats next to a venue and then trying to close it down you know, and they got it to such a good stage that last year was the first year in, since they formed but actually there was more uh, grassroots music venues opening than closing um, so it was really positive but obviously now it's uh, hit the sector very very hard and a lot of these sectors are you know very small um, a lot of these places are very small venues run by people with a passion, you know, it's not a profit. If you, if you want to make a millions, you don't open a grassroots music venue. Um, you know, they're run by people who have got a passion for music, a passion for the arts and work closely with their communities to bring, you know, music to people in a safe space, which is what we've always tried to do. And again, with us, you know, the live music, we make our money on the club nights, um, which is even less likely to happen than live music at the moment. Live music we do is because we're passionate about it and it's part, part of what models has always been about. Um, so yeah, it's very tough times, but working with the Music Venues Trust has been really positive. Um, they've part of a big uh, panel that have been speaking to DCMS. Um, they've actually got his ear quite a lot. They're actually, you know, on one of the working group, group panels that regularly um, speak to them and speak to Oliver Dowden. Um, and there is talks that it's going to be a, sub, uh, a financial support for, for this sector because we, we literally can't open at the moment, you know, as, as you all know, you know, we can't put music on, we can't open. Um, so whilst all the pubs and everything else is opening, we, you know, we're being told you have to stay closed. Um, if, so they, we're, we're asking for support for the sector to keep everyone going till October. I mean, we can probably keep, we can keep going till October anyway, because we've had a good couple of years. We've been which is very fortunate. But um, there's many venues in our sector that are, if, if the support package doesn't happen, we'll be closing. You know, we, we, there's literally about 400 venues at risk at the moment. Um, so hopefully we'll have some good news on that soon. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for, for coming along and, and talking to us today. And I hope you'll stick around and join us for the, the panel discussion at the end as well. And Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me. No worries. No worries at all. So we'll just turn, turn you off and then we were going to bring in our next... Uh, Next guest, who will be Ian McGlynn from the Rondo Theatre. So we'll just unmute and bring the video back online. Hello, Ian. Hello. How are you doing? Sorry, you were very quiet. 
think we might have so, a connection there slightly, Ian. We're, we're experiencing one of those moments, Ian, you know, the joy of the, the keynote uh, uh, news at 10 interview, and then suddenly the, uh, the interviewer is talking to each other and padding. So that's what Luke and I are going to do right now, I think, while uh, Ian reconnects. Can you hear us again now, Ian? Uh, hello. It's a tiny Can bit. Can hear me? Yes. Shall we come back? To you? Um, right, we'll come back to you in a bit, Ian, and see if we can get you connected again. Uh, so let's bring in Tracy from the Merlin Theatre in Thrun. It's the joy of liveness. Oh, I miss liveness. Hello, Tracy. Oh, hello. I'm sitting below the screen. Hi. Am I there? You are. Hi. Um, thank you for um, inviting us along. Um, strictly speaking, we're not in Bath, but uh, really uh, appreciate being involved in this and, and to hear what people have to say. And I think we're going to be uh, seeking some thoughts and advice as well. Um, the Merlin director, um, is uh, Claudia, um, is actually... Um, running one of our um, youth theatres online at the moment. So I'm representing the Merlin. I'm not um, technically an employee of the Merlin. I'm a freelance um, comms and marketing person. I work largely for the Merlin. So forgive me if I don't have every single um, fact and figure to hand, but um, I'm pretty close to what's happening most of the time at the Merlin. Um, it's great to hear um, quite a positive um, sense from everybody because it has been horribly doom and gloom hasn't it and um, we've ch had an extraordinary um, couple of weeks um, I don't know if people know that we, sh we share our space during the daytime and during the daytime and term time the space belongs to the school it's actually a school building although it's a purpose-built theatre uh, we can only um, access it for our purposes which is largely as a receiving house um, for visiting theatre companies and for live screen from about 4.15 onwards on weekdays and full-time at weekends and during the holidays. So we already have limitations. We have no funding to speak of. That was cut many years ago and all the employees um, went many years ago. So we have the equivalent salary of one, uh, one full-time um, employee that's split between two people. And then people like myself um, do some freelance work and all our front of house staff, box office, bar, cafe, all volunteers. I know the business of volunteers came up before. And as you were rightly saying, Bryn, you know, they are treated in exactly the same way as one would uh, an employee, except perhaps even more duty of care, um, because the largest number of our volunteers are over 70 as well. So that brought in a shielding issue right at the beginning before even full lockdown. Um, we've had an extraordinary kind of um, week or two, having run our um, small resources, but then again, we only have very small outgoings, our small resources um, nearly dry. We put a call out um, for just straightforward donations in the hope that we might get £5,000 to help secure our immediate future while we worked out what to do next. And um, we have gone way over £10,000 by just literally social media saying to people, would you please give us some money? And they have. It's been amazing. Uh, so we now secured um, our immediate sort of short term future, which means that um, the people who work as employees can come off furlough and start moving forward. Our plan at the moment, we have an outdoor space as well as the indoor space. The outdoor space is referred to as ECOS. It's the European Community of Stones and it's an amphitheatre. Our current plan, and it might be helpful if anybody has... Um, any real insight onto the guidance because we're a little confused as to what dates we can do this because on the one hand we are sort of um, reading that you can't do live performance but on the other hand we are hearing that such things as Glyndebourne are going ahead so we could um, arrange the space which is outdoor to have social distancing on stage it's quite large it would be you know small scale shows only and the seating um, is actually a much larger area than the indoor and obviously people would pre-book and sit within their bubble 
with spaces between them. So it would be limited audience numbers. We've put a call out to um, local professional performers to ask people if they would like to um, bid to be a part of that. And this will be a fundraising exercise as well. So we're quite excited about that, but not quite sure what the rule is about us doing that. Um, after that, we are hoping to open shortly for live screening, but um, obviously very limited audience numbers because I don't know if any of you've seen on our Instagram and on our Facebook and on our Twitter the picture of our staff meeting yesterday where the seats have been marked out with red and white tape to so make sure that there are two meters between people. It was an exercise as much as anything to uh, see what that looked like and um, potentially it'd be great if people have got good ideas because we live or die by our income we don't have funding to speak of we are reliant on ticket money our community productions um which are the ones that tend to run for as many as five six seven in the case of the christmas show nine shows are often sold out but they're sold out because they're packed and they're packed on stage as well as off and we only have two little dressing rooms we are going to have to get seriously creative and we don't quite know how to as to how we can do that because running at a 30 percent ticket income we, yeah we are wondering how that will work and at the moment the outdoor space looks like our best option for now i think that's kind of where we're at brilliant well thank you very much for that tracy uh, it's just really good to see here um I mainly ask you because I know you've got that outdoor space and it's kind of almost ready to go, so to speak. So um, I kind of really wanted just to see how you guys were, were handling it. And, and like you said, the, the, the legislation at the moment isn't particularly clear. But I know Martin Popel's just posted in the chat that the, there is some guidance that's available, which he's happy to to share with us all. So um, I, I'll have Thanks, Martin. Great. to share that over to me and then I'll send it out to all of our panellists and uh, if, we're, if we're allowed, put it on the website and things for people to see as well. So thank you very much, Tracy. We're going to um, bring you back later for the, uh, the live chat. Um, we're going to try and bring Ian back in again. As, as, as we bring Ian back in, just a little note of caution um, on the guidance. And, and I say this from a personal point of view, and I may well be uh, wrong. But I think what you might find is that where people have a, um, a, pre a presenting a guidance with and see how it fits with the national instructions. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Bryn. Right, Ian, let's just try again. How are you doing? Oh. Okay, yeah. Is that any better? We can just about hear you. I can't see you at the moment. Okay, right. Um... It is sounding quite distorted at the moment. Can you hear me? Um, okay. I will. If you can, if you can add um, Alison in, I'll wish down if that's any better. Yeah, perfect. We'll do that. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Brid, if I can bring you back in for a moment, please. Yeah, certainly. I think. Um, we're just having a little demonstration there of one of the things that we're looking at as, uh, at the forum, which is that if we do move to some sort of element of perhaps an option of a live ticket for those that can be fitted in in a socially distanced way, um, and therefore perhaps promoters might need to sell a, a live ticket option and a streams ticket option. And I think we've seen today how um, you can believe that you've got a strong uh, internet connection, perhaps not. So that's something else that I think people are considering. Many people in the live environment, as has already been said, will, will want to keep that unique identity and are therefore not going down the streamed route. But uh, uh, it's something that we, we're considering and looking at, but you need to look at both your equipment and your ability to, um, to get that out without the the little tricky difficulties that we faced in a small part today. Brilliant. Right, let's try and bring you back in, Ian. Uh, third time lucky. Here we go. Hey, there we are. Hello, how are you doing, Ian? All right, is that better? That's much better. 
Okay, how are you? How's the rondo? How are things? Okay. Um, yeah, in the same position um, as everybody else, really. We can't open. We don't know when we can open. Um, all the rest of it. It's all it's all very um, worrying, concerning, but we're, we're trying our best. Um, we've been doing some uh, building work. Um, we've blocked off some windows with bricks, which should help uh, insulate us from the uh, noise from the uh, air conditioning from the shop next door. Uh, we've relayed a path, um, you know, doing all the, all the kind of things you can do. Um, but at the moment, we've still got no idea when we can open. That's the, that's the hard thing. Um, and as a, a theatre that depends a lot on uh, touring comedy, touring theatre, um, you know, local productions, um, people just don't know when they can start, you know, rehearsing to uh, put on a show. I mean, the government have given useless guidelines saying that rehearsals can, socially distanced rehearsals can start now, but uh, rehearsals are absolutely useless until you know what the opening night is. Um, so we're faced with a, um, a pointless, rudderless um, set of um, I, I use the word guidance is very, very loosely from government. They've done a very, very bad job in supporting the arts and giving us any clear indication of what things are, when they can start up. Um, and if they can't start up, as we're in the, you know, the case at the moment, uh, absolute lack of um, financial support. We're told we have to remain closed because live performances can't um, go on. Uh, but no support for that. Um, we feel a bit bitter in that um, we've had the same government grant that uh, shops, pubs, everyone else has, but shops and pubs, et cetera, are now allowed to open. We're not. So our funding needs to be renewed and re-looked at. Uh, we feel very strongly about that. We have in place for when we do reopen, um, working in partnership with our, our fantastic box office providers, Ticket Source. They've got a resource where you can do socially distanced booking. So, for instance, if you were to book two seats, the booking algorithm would automatically book out the two seats behind you, the two seats in front of you and the seats either side of you. So we can do um, socially distanced booking, uh, which is great. What we can't do or what is very hard to do, as in all small venues, is socially distance things like the dressing rooms, the backstage areas, the toilets, the bar, the corridors, the foyer. So socially distance operating is going to be very, very hard. Um, we don't know what the, again, the guidance is will be when we reopen. We will probably have to do what they're doing on public transport in uh, making the use of uh, face masks mandatory. Um, but we just don't know because guidance is not forthcoming. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that. You know, that's kind of given us a really good sort of snapshot of of where you are at the moment. And, um, you know, hopefully in the, the discussion panel that we have later, I mean, there's, there's loads of questions coming. We probably won't get to all of them, but, um, you know, I think it really just helps from, to, for people to hear exactly what's going on, really. Um, uh, so they get a better idea of it, really, and how they can help, I think. So... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's uh, the main way that people can help at the moment really is to is to um, donate to our fundraiser. Um, we've kind of we took the position in March that we needed to raise uh, approximately fifteen thousand uh, pounds to keep us going until the autumn. We thought at that point that opening in September was going to happen. Um, ha 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 ha. Um, so uh, you can reach our fundraiser through our, our website or through our Facebook page or through Twitter. Um, we, as I say, originally thought £15,000 would, would help us stay up until the autumn. Uh, now the autumn looks like it's not going to happen or if it does happen, it will be late autumn. So we're going to have to sort of stretch the target to possibly £20,000, £25,000 just to keep us going, um, you know, so that we're, we're there to open when we can. Um, we, we kind of reprogrammed a lot of acts from the spring season into the autumn season. And now a lot of those acts have hopped into spring uh, 2021, sort of starting from January. Uh, we're still, you know, give you an idea of it, the comedy festival, which was due to go on the first two weeks of April, we're still rebooking and then re-rebooking acts from that, um, you know, to try and to try and have a coherent season. So if if we can open in the autumn, we will certainly try to. But um, as I said, it's it's not 
reopening a theatre is not like reopening a cinema or a shop where you've got stock or a backlog of films to show. There's a huge backlog in terms of um, either comedians booking tours or theatre companies booking tours, uh, booking rehearsal time, knowing what, what work they're going to do, the availability of actors who may well have moved on to other things. Um, so it's very difficult. Um, um, we're lucky to be working in partnership with people like The Naturals who have work ready to go at reasonably short notice um, that we can, you know, put things on. But um, we just don't know when that's going to be. That's the problem. OK, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that, Ian. We'll bring you back in again at the end for the quick Q&A. Um, I've just noticed that Linda Todd from the councils here and she wants to pop in and say a little bit about outdoor events so i will just try and bring linda in as well um there's been quite a few questions about outdoor events and safety around those so hopefully uh when linda joins us uh she'll be able to give us a little bit more information on that yes welcome uh, linda hello linda. how are you doing hi um, Linda from the council, that always makes me laugh. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I'm the um, Bath and North East Somerset Council team manager for outdoor events. So any, any outdoor event that takes place on council land or highways comes through the events office and I will be familiar with and a lot of people on here will be familiar with um, working with me as, as well. Um, I, you know, it's just an awful situation, isn't it? Particularly for the, you know, for the for the indoor venues. Um, good, you know, goodness knows when the guidance will come through um, loud and clear for those. Um, I'd like to just say to Chris that I did buy my Grace and Perry tickets while I was um, waiting to come in. So I want one more customer for you there with a, with a gift aid. So um, yeah, really pleased to sit, to hear about um, you know that that. Um, uh, venue opening up again um so in terms of outdoor events um the, so the the events office is a member of the national outdoor events association who um feeds into the dcms and so we've been putting questions pressure to government through that source and we've been getting the guidance and the information um back through that source as well we do get daily updates from them um we are unfortunately nowhere near yet having mass gatherings outdoor events and i can you know only guess the same as anybody else we we're not privy to any information before um the prime minister announces it um it's it, we get it in real time the same time as everybody else so um i i, I have another meeting to go on to so i'm sorry i can't sort of be around for for you know questions and answers but you can always contact me um, through uh, my email address at the council. Um, the simplest one is probably uh, event at bathness.gov.uk and that, that those messages can, and queries can be forwarded on to me. But I would just like to give a bit of advice. So um, if, if you, you know, if any of the, the, the people in this group today, and I think it's a fantastic group and thanks to Luke for, you know, and um, Brim for putting it together. I would just say, if you are planning on doing an outdoor event, get your event management plan into us, your application, your event management plan into us as soon as possible. Even if you think it may happen in August, it may happen in September, it may be in December. Um, we, we, what we do is we um, feed, and some of you will already know this, so I don't preach to the, um, to the converted, but... Um, the, the way the events um, office works for events on council land and highways is you make your application and we look check the dates for you and we get back to you say that looks like a goer and then eight weeks prior to your event date we expect to receive full and final documentation and it might seem like an awful long way in advance but the reason that we ask um, this of you is so that the events office staff, myself and Jenny, and we have an apprentice now, um, which is great. Um, we will check through all of your documentation. And if we've got any missings, we will then come back to you and ask you to provide a little bit more information, um, maybe an additional risk assessment for COVID-19, how you're going to manage your event. Then when you've brought that, you know, brought that, all that information back to us, we then just recheck and then we send it out to the safety advisory group for events. 
And the safety advisory group for um, events members include um, public protection, public health now, actually, that we've got COVID. It'll be fire, police, ambulance. It will be noise, food safety. So it'll be a whole raft of experts who we will um, call on their experience to, um, in order to uh, scrutinise that documentation and make sure that, you know, you're going to have a safe and, and, and very successful event um, in Baines. Um, the safety advisory group for events is it, consultations usually done through something that we we have um, a system we have called event app and that enables us to do a virtual sage um, but with every event that's coming through now and there aren't many but there are some um, we we then take we, we are taking you through a zoom sage meeting so that you will have all of those experts there to have at your disposal to have those conversations with because what we really need to think about is not just protecting the council's reputation, first of all, even you know, for an event taking place on Ladder Highways, we have to do that. But it's also um, it's also protecting your own reputation as well as an event organizer. Um, the, the last event that took place before lo lockdown was the Bath Half Marathon, and I'm sure anyone who's got presence on social media will understand, you know, the slating that they got, um, you know, for that event going ahead, but they were, um, that they were scrutinized, they were acting within, um, you know, they were acting within uh, the public, uh, sorry, the, the, the government guidance at that time. And that's all we can ask an event organizer to do is, you know, to, to act in within um, government guidance, and we will then put it through that SAGE scrutiny panel to, you know, to, to say whether that can go ahead or not. Um, so I just wanted to give you an overview of how we work because it's not often we have an opportunity to have these conversations, all of us together. And, you know, I am here, the team's here, and we are, you know, here to, to answer any questions um, that, that you have in relation to any outdoor events that you have planned, in, you know, for, for, for the near future. Um, I'll say it's been a really lean spring, summer, um, the events uh, for this year have mainly gone over to next year now. Um, so we, the next one we have coming up is possibly the Lunar Cinema on the Royal Crescent Lower Lawn. Um, as we're still, still at the stage where you can't have more than 30 people together, uh, there are no mass gatherings. We don't know what's going to happen with that. So we're hoping that the government guidance will be um, will come through and that event will be able to go ahead. There's an event taking place on Bath Race Course um, on, I think it was on the 7th to the 12th, 12th of July, which is um, the drive and dine. So that's just been through its safety advisory group for events. And that is within the government guidance. Uh, outdoor cinemas are now permitted. So it's just watching that space um and we haven't published anything actually because the, the 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 guidance is changing day on day and we are trying to interpret interpret that day on day um there's lots of information online i'd say firstly go to the government website and if you need any help in translating that guidance what it means for you in terms of licensing or what it means for you in terms of an outdoor event then i would say just pick up the phone or, or email us and we'll get back to you as soon as possible Lovely, thank you very much. I hope that's helped. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. It's great to hear that side of things, uh, really. So I'm sure lots of people will now be in contact with you to sort of ask about events and things. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. I'm going to bring in now Andrew Bartlett from Enlightened Lighting. Well, I think while Andrew joins us, we've been dealing with some questions quickly to reduce the Q&A. And so those folks that have been asking about impromptu events, that probably answers your question that to suddenly try and do an impromptu sort of flash mob style uh, event in these current times is something that you would be uh, best advised to avoid, I think. Uh, so there we go. Brilliant. Right. Thank you. Uh, how are you doing, Andrew? How's things over at Enlightened? Hi there, Luke. Thanks for organising this. Uh, yeah, we're we're still still there. Um, for those that don't know, Enlightened, we supply technical services to to the uh, theatre industry as one of our lines of business. So you say we're a supplier as opposed to uh, anything else. Um, theatre is one of the elements that we support, along with corporate entertainment as and hospitality and things as well. So um, we had a slight head start back in March when every phone call was cancelling work as opposed to before the government said uh, no can do. 
um, but that was a pretty tough time. So we cut everybody hours um, and then a furlough came along and saved the day in, in many degrees. Uh, that's coming to an end. Um, as Andy Burden said, there's some harsh realities, some tough business decisions being made um, and we have restructured uh, to make us fit for the next 12 months is the reality of it. Um, but yeah, we're, a, we're not a debt laden company. We're very fortunate. We're financially prudent. Um, we will get through this. Many companies aren't going to. Um, there's already been several that have uh, seen their assets up for auction, things that aren't going to make it through. So enlightened in that sense, we're very, very lucky in that we're prudent and going to be able to get through this. Um, one of the things I've been very adamant with all of our staff about is to use this time so constructively. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to be paid 80% of your salary to, to do personal development. Um, not since I was at university was I in the, yeah, being able to do that. And for others with families, we've had amazing times with our families. So it, that there are positives from the, uh, from the other side of it, um, but we're desperate to be back at work. Um, the, the glimmer of hope is that the phone is starting to ring again. Um, we're being as flexible as we can be with cancellation. So we're encouraging people to book, even if they're going to cancel. Um, we just want to start the conversations and uh, get working again. There's looking like small potential of a couple of small private parties over the summer with people doing kind of gatherings of 30 and things. Um, but we're, we're being very conscious that we need to look ahead for the, the autumn and winter season. Now um, the summer's gone um, from the, corporate side of things there's going to be a massive future in the hybrid events industry where you're doing streaming and doing live um, we've chosen not to build our own studio in a warehouse which some companies have done because we'd rather use facilities of companies and theaters and venues that have the the hospitality and have the uh, the welfare facilities um, nobody wants to use the toilets of a warehouse when there's a theater that could provide the facilities and things so that's where we'd like to provide all of our streaming services and uh, event production services to people using fully fledged venues um, just seems to us to make more sense. Uh, sales and installation, our installers team are getting out and about, which is fantastic to see again. So schools are keen to get their client compliance testing up to date. And I'd encourage all venues to, to use the time to get their testing and certification up to date, even if it's with risk assessments that will redate it depending on use and all that kind of stuff, because there are ways around the kind of the, the rigid 12 month boundaries of testing things. Uh, something I'd like to highlight to everybody though is the lighted and red campaign um, to highlight the emergency within our industry. Uh, it's encouraging to people light people's buildings in red on the 6th of July. So if you want to take part in that and you want to borrow some equipment from Enlightened then get in touch. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that Andrew. No worries. And we'll bring you back again shortly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, our last speakers for today, and I know there's a couple of people that want to jump in uh, and chat as well, are Wendy and Steve from The Fringe. So we'll bring them in quickly and then we'll bring everyone in together to try and answer all of these questions that have come in. They've been great. So thank you, everyone, for, for bringing all those uh, questions to us. Um, so whilst Wendy and Steve come in, um, how are you doing, Wendy, Steve? Oh, you're muted, I believe. Huge. <laughs> there we go. How are we doing? Fine. Yeah, that's fine. Go, go. Hello, hi. Um, yeah, we, uh, as you probably are aware, we didn't have the Fringe Festival this year. Uh, we weren't able to go ahead. We were, we were hoping to, uh, for quite a while, hoping that we might be able to, and then it became obvious that we weren't able to uh, uh, as venues were closing down they weren't going to be open we weren't going to be able to have a fringe festival so um we did put we decided like uh, the naturals that we weren't really going to do much online either because there seemed to be floods and floods of content that um was far too much for anybody to take in so we did do some put, post some archive material from previous outdoor events and uh, walk up nation shows and old walk up festivals which was received quite well and had a few performances that, that particular people that wanted to do that we uh, were, were either streamed or were put on our website. Um, we are, we weren't able to do our outdoor event, Bedlam Fair. Um, we got Arts Council funding for this um, and with the proviso that we can still 
pay the artists, uh, the, the Arts Council would like us to still employ the artists uh, for an event in the future. And we're still hoping that this might possibly go ahead um, at some point later on in the uh, summer stroke autumn. I'll pass over to Steve and you can talk about that. Bit. I, 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 just to echo what Andy said, out, um, outdoor arts and unfamiliar, um, what's the word, informal setups like that have always been different, have always done things differently, have always played around with where the audience is and how the performers and audience interact. So, uh, so our performers and the people who uh, create, write those performances have all the opportunity to do that as ever. Um, because we've, as when it says, still got Arts Council money to spend until it runs out. Um, we are enabling some of those companies to move into this rehearsal phase, uh, which is a which is a curiosity. I'd not I'd not really thought that we were supporting government policy in that way. But as we have got a still got a performance opportunity further down the further down the road, um, the people that we're going to be using for that are able to move into that phase. Um, I suppose the one other thing to say is that we are trying to keep up with what's possible in venues a little bit, but definitely outdoors and to be a resource of information and good practice and what other people are doing about that. And so happy to talk email with anybody about that. I'm not saying we know we know it all, but we're just trying to keep up. Yeah. Perfect. Well, it's good. It seems very positive. What I'm going to do now quickly is just bring everyone back in because I realise we're slightly over the time that we said we would be, which is kind of a lovely place to be. And we had so many people come forwards uh, to to kind of join us today. So thank you, everyone who's either joined us watching or who has joined us uh, as a panellist. Um, I'll hand you back over to Bryn quickly for a moment, just while I bring everyone else back in. Yeah, so what, what I've tried to do, um, and we, we may perhaps miss one or two, but I hope not, is I'd encourage you to go back to the start of uh, the webinar and watch it from the beginning if you don't hear your question answered, because we've answered some questions as we've gone along, and I've tried to keep a note, you can see me just looking off screen there, uh, I've tried to keep a note of the questions that we haven't dealt with, during the course of the webinar. So in this Q&A, what we'll try and do is deal with those questions that I think we haven't uh, fully addressed as we've been going along. Um, uh, whether, uh, we, Luke and I haven't discussed what we might do in the future, so I suspect um, that we may well do another one of these in the future for new questions and as the, uh, as the scene arrives. So I don't know if you've noticed there, but I've just managed to hand more work to loop uh, live on a webinar. That's so, absolutely fine. Um, we what we'll do, um, because we are over, we'll just do 10 minutes of question and answers if that's okay, and then kind of finish dead on 20 past because I know it's it's 20 minutes later than I promised it would be. So um, we'll keep it as quick as we can, but also try and answer as many things as we possibly can as well. So while Luke just deals with the technicals there, I'll start off perhaps with a question. Uh, somebody's asked about what we think the future of smaller productions may be. Um, and I actually have a view that some of the large spaces, perhaps like the forum, may find that their content has gone um, into next year or whatever. So it, it's possible that we have a space that we can use um, that we uh, actually don't have content for. So smaller productions may be able to come into larger spaces and suddenly become socially distant uh, production. So that would be my view on that. And I suspect that the other might, uh, might join me in that view. And you'll, you'll forgive me if you can hear some noise in the background. As I've said, I'm at the Forum Coffee House where the staff are preparing to... Uh, to... Luke, have... if I come in there, I think definitely there'll be um, to kind of imagine production as a um as a slightly different version of what they were certainly about that in the end with early years, where 
um, there's a certain amount of like licking <laughs> happening <laughs> for year olds. So that definitely needs some social distancing. So we might be looking at that kind of work and yeah, thinking about things a bit more dynamic. I think there's also a question I saw pop up about work in development at the moment. And I think that again is going to need a slightly different approach because certainly at commissioning the elements that we can now, like writing, um, or some of the idea development, um, where people can do that online or at home alone, rather than commissioning all the creative work at the same time. So we're kind of splitting things out and doing early stage R and D on work where we've already got some funds in place. <laughs> Uh, how about everyone else? How are your plans? Well, they're not at the moment. Until we get some guidelines, we can't have any plans. This is this is the problem. Yeah. Well, this is this is the five step plan which everyone's kind of been scratching their heads about. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not keen on it. It's kind of, it's come out, but we need the funding there, and we also need some deadlines and some timelines on it. That's my personal view. It needs dates on it to kind of tell us when can we start doing all of these things. Um, there are options out there to kind of do outdoor performances and, and things like that, as as we've heard, but that doesn't suit every venue. Um, you know, even some of the big venues are going to struggle doing outdoor performances. I think. Um, so uh, another question we've had in, uh, we've had kind of two similar ones really, is does Bath need kind of, similar to like we had the cultural forum before that brought everyone together, but some sort of kind of galvanising organisation that brings everyone together uh, and kind of campaigns for theatre and the arts within Bath? Uh, who'd like to pick up with that one? I think, I'll, uh... I think it um, depends what that organisation does. And there was a point for, I don't know if you're going to come to it, Ian Stockley about isn't this the time to sort of campaign to the government. I think, you know, we have to think about what we're arguing. I mean, I was putting that, you know, we can't change the thinking of a government until there's a, an election. And even then, I'm not sure we can. But I think there are specific things. And I think that um, it was said by the guy from Moles and so on and, and Ian, that actually a lot of things are shut. There is a very specific thing here. Would the government extend that business support grant, a further grant to people who are therefore shut? The other thing is that everybody in an industry that uh, is suffering from this, would they extend the furlough scheme for our industry? And most importantly, would they extend the self employed support scheme because our industry is very 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 different and i think if we looked at very specific targets that we could say right let's go to the, the mp and go to the government and say and i think i was at the meeting yesterday in vera hub house was saying that a lot of people are in this trouble this problem and bath is a tourism city there is hospitality venues that will have us that could join in and have a stronger voice. But I, my, my view is that anything like that would have to be specific. I don't know what people, that's my view. I don't know what people. Uh, we, we've we actually got a, with, with the Music Venues Trust, um, I mentioned earlier, we actually did do a specific campaign. We did we did a, a, a rival five, five step plan because of a practically, practically useless one that the government posted, which I can read to you quickly if you like. It was step one, create a set to specific support financial package immediately. So that the functioning model of the grassroots music venue success survives to require more steps. Step two, have you completed step one? No, go back to step one. Yes, step three, get out of the way of one of the most dynamic and innovative creative industries in the world and let get, and get on with it. Step four, continue to receive massive social, cultural and economic benefits for decades to come because you get got steps one, two and three right. Step five, realise this doesn't need five steps, it only needs steps one, two and three, then have the weekend off, but not at the beach. And I think that kind of sums it up, you know, that, that's what the sector does need. The sector needs a financial support package and it needs it urgently. And I think that um, speaks into another question that's come in um, about the financial model of um, the industry. I think it has suddenly focused the uh, society's mind on the amount of money that the arts does bring in. I think in the past, it's perhaps been seen as a drain on uh, funds. 
and then folks suddenly realise, I forget the figures, but it's that its uh, economic um, value is is many billions. So I think that that may see a change in the way that arts is funding. And I know that there's been a question about will we see less public funding and more philanthropy and, and so on. But I think as we realise what a real big industry this is and the amount of money that it does bring into the country and to its local areas, um, I, I, I hesitate to um, have a view on what that will mean for people's funding models going forward. Um, because there is no doubt that people are now suddenly realising they are missing music, they are missing theatre, the things that they're doing to entertain themselves at home are Netflix, which is basically you know, theatre on TV, music, uh, different screenings, different live sessions. And so I think people will value it more and that may affect the future funding models for the arts. Definitely. I think that kind of a question came in from from Ian Stockley and he says, are we accelerating the funding model on what was well with us before COVID-19, moving further away from the funding, uh, public funding closer to the US model of philanthropy and private funding? Or do we see it as an opportunity to change government thinking? Um, so, you know, I think if anything, in my personal opinion, this this whole crisis has shown that actually without the arts, uh, life is so much more boring. You know, you look at all the content that people have produced for free a lot of the time or for donations uh, that have kept people entertained during this, this whole crisis. And it's kind of like, it goes back to that question of what would the world be like without art? And I think that's the, the battle we need to fight maybe next. Um, I, I, just to say, I mean, I think the funding um, model has moved on. I know. Speaking for the Rondo, we haven't had any public funding for the best part of a decade. Um, and working as a truly independent organisation, and that's why this is particularly hurting us now, because our only revenue comes from selling tickets and, and selling drinks at the bar. Perfect. Well, well I, think... I, think quickly, um, I think I think on that sort of I think that things that's happened at the Rondo and at the Merlin, it shows that people are contributing, people are, are helping, people want the arts. We've seen that. That could be the beginning of the model Ian was talking about, you know. Uh, but I'd also like to just quickly put in here, if we were going to moan about anything, and I do get fed up with artists moaning, I think we should ask for accountability from the Arts Council about how they distributed the rescue, rescue grant, why they've used all the money on the rescue grant. I'd love to know how much was spent in Bath. And I would like to know what's happening with the grants for arts and what they're doing. We don't have to do this. What they're going to do to go to the government and ask for more money, because uh, if they're going to distribute the grants. But I would love to see the actual criteria by which they distribute, by which they distributed millions of pounds of public money and used up apparently nearly all of their grant money. And I think that is something that I think could use, usefully be seen. I don't think anyone will have to see it. We'll, we'll see quite an interesting pattern if that was ever shown. Yeah, that data is available. Um, Adam Powell has, has put together a great spreadsheet. Mm. Uh, you know, it's got all of that, that data in there and you can see by the region and actually you can see companies who have received that money. Um, and you can also see a breakdown of the individual money. Uh, regarding their checklist, I did this with applications a few years ago. We can put in a freedom of information request and request the checklist that they actually check those applications against. So, you know, because they're a public body, we can hold them accountable in that way. And yeah, absolutely right, we should do. Um, does anyone else have any points to wrap up with? Uh, we've just gone past the past. So, um, uh, just a quick thing on that is that tomorrow of course is the launch of uh, the hashtag uh, let the music play and I know that there's another um, social media campaign I think it's called uh, the hashtag is we uh, we make events we are events um, and I think it would be worth uh, public and organizations if you're listening to try and get on board with that as a way of um, demonstrating the, the need for the creative arts in this area and beyond. I've put those links in the uh, chat for, for all attendees to see as well. Perfect. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Adams just could corrected me and said that uh, he just shared the link. He didn't create it. Uh, he said, Bath and Northwest Somerset had six orgs which shared £175,636 and 35 individuals that shared £75,267. So... 
Uh, hello, uh, Tracy, go on. Um, I think one of the things we have to um, be conscious of as well is it's not just about us. Um, you know, it's fantastic that people have become aware that at, at the heart of everything really is creativity. And that is one of the things that lockdown has shown. But also I saw uh, Tristan um, Carter and Sue Hill pop up in um, on the webinars asking questions who are local uh, people who train and educate young people who want to be performers. And actually, a lot of this disrespect and um, lack of interest, um, unwillingness to um, to fund or support people like ourselves goes back a few years into the way it's been treated in education. You know, this has been cut out of education. Oh, music, that's not important. Oh, drama, that's not important. You know, these people are going to come through and, you know, I'll tell, as a good socialist, I'll tell you now, replace yourself. That's your first role in this world is who's going to replace because we're going to move on and through it, hopefully successfully. But actually there are hundreds, thousands of young people who've been deprived of even a look in on any of this and thank goodness there are schools that are doing this sort of privately like BSA and people but actually we have to involve them in all of this and we have to look back at lobbying to education as well so if the education ministers aren't interested in having this and the schools can't support it then we'll find ourselves I think with another problem when we get through this one. Luke I think um, just to add to Tracy's brilliant point um, I think what has been great is that through the Arts Council Emergency Fund, um, that did immediately prompt some cross-city working with the um, main organisations involved in Bath Cultural Education Partnership, pledging a proportion of their fund into a joint project directly aimed at supporting the most vulnerable children, making sure that they've got access to arts now and in the immediate future. And so that is the great opportunity, as Ian says, to kind of galvanise us into new projects, new ways of working, partnerships that haven't happened before. Brilliant. Good. OK, well, I think if that's OK, with everyone, I'm going to wrap it up there and just say thank you very much to all of our panellists for joining us today. Thank uh, you. To everyone who came along and watched the, the video of this will be available on YouTube and we'll share that, share that on our social media and things as well. But thank you very much, everyone. Uh, as the old theatre saying goes, break a leg. I'm not going to say the other words. Um, and we'll try and do this again maybe in a couple of months' time, a month's time, and just have a check-in with several different organisations as well, uh, just see where we all are and, you know, that's it, how things are panning out, really, I guess. So thank you all very much for joining us and um, hopefully see you all in person soon. Thank you, Luke. Thanks, Luke. Thank you, Luke. Thanks, Luke. Thank you. All right.